On this day, exactly 100 years ago, the Paris Peace Treaty of Saint-Germain dealing with the breakup of the Austrian part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire came into effect. Before watching this video, I suggest you go watch my previous video about the final days of Austria-Hungary. As you know, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was divided into two main parts, the Austrian and the Hungarian. As such, at the end of World War I, there were two separate Paris Peace Treaties dealing with the two separate parts of the Empire. Today we're going to look at the immediate post-war history of the Austrian part of the Empire and the Peace Treaty dealing with it, the Treaty of Saint-Germain. However, before we look at anything specific, this map needs to be addressed. It is a map showing the ethnic makeup of the Austrian half of the Empire, and therefore it is very important to understand because because many of the underlying issues talked about in this video revolve around ethnic boundaries. The problem is this map, which is oftentimes shown when talking about post-war Austria-Hungary, does not necessarily show the ethnic makeup of the empire. Let me explain. This map and others like it are based off of the 1910 Austro-Hungarian census. Side note here, this census was conducted a bit differently by the two separate political entities of the empire and today I will talk only about the Austrian census, not the Hungarian one. The first thing that needs to be addressed about this census is that just because a province on the map is showing, let's say, Polish as a majority, that doesn't mean it was the only ethnicity living there. A more accurate representation would be this. And yes, I made the map myself, and I know it's not perfect, but it will have to do as it took me like a week to make. Anyways, so whenever you see a map like this, keep in mind it only shows the majority ethnicity of a province, not the whole population. Second, the Austrian census never asked for a person's ethnicity outright. It only asked for a person's Umgangssprache, which translates into something like everyday spoken language. Meaning what the census actually recorded was a person's most spoken everyday language. Therefore, this map does not show ethnic divisions, but language divisions, which even though are very heavily correlated with ethnic divisions, aren't the same thing. For example, it was completely common for people who lived in the border regions and identified as Czechs to use mainly German as that was the language at work or even at large social gatherings. And these kinds of people would be identified as Austrian Germans in the census and on this map. Therefore, it has to be stated that due to this reason, Austrian Germans are overreported in the 1910 census and subsequently also in the map created from the census. However, this is not to say the census and the map is completely wrong. Especially because when adjusted for post-war migrations, it is very similar to the censuses conducted after the war. But also from these comparisons, it becomes clear that Austrian Germans were in fact overreported in the 1910 census, but not by some huge margin as some nationalists would have you believe. So when looking at this map, keep in mind it is a map showing the most spoken self-identified language in an area, not the majority ethnicity in an area even though those two things are very heavily correlated. Now, when it came to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, Austria was for the most part at the start completely ignored, with the Entente being heavily preoccupied drafting a peace treaty for Germany as it was seen by the Allies as the largest future threat. Therefore, the Austrian delegation at the start of the peace talks struggled to even get a meeting with the Allied Council. Eventually, they were assigned their own council and a draft of a peace treaty was made for Austria, a draft in which Austria had very little say in, but such were the peace negotiations for any losing power in the Paris Peace Conference. As it stood, the main points of what was to become the Treaty of Saint-Germain were 1. Austria losing all of its non-core land, including the German majority in Bohemia 2. Austria having to pay war reparations, but these were actually never truly defined and later kind of forgotten about on purpose because Austria didn't really have the post-war economy to pay for them anyways 3. The successor states had the right to seize all state property of the former empire which lied within their border 4. All successor states will be held accountable to hold a percentage of the former empire is dead as defined by the Allies. 5. There will be a plebiscite held in the province of Carinthia, which got taken over by Yugoslavian forces during the confusing mess which was the breakup of Austria-Hungary. 6. The German majority Burgenland, which is currently held by Hungary, will be given to Austria. 7. German Austria is to renounce all claims to the German majority lands of the former empire and to symbolize this change its name to just Austria. Also, it is not allowed under any circumstances to unite with Germany at any point in the future. Of course, there were many more points of the Saint-Germain Treaty than I have stated, 376 more points to be exact, but there's no time to mention them all. The Peace Treaty of Saint-Germain was concluded and begrudgingly signed by the Austrians 10th of September 1919. However, while all these negotiations were happening in Paris, life didn't just stop in the former lands of the Empire, and in fact, it became in many ways even more chaotic than it already was. 
For example, when Czechoslovakia was proclaimed on October 28th, the German population living in the lands of the Bohemian crown declared their own independence, quickly establishing their own governing bodies and proclaiming loyalty to the Austrian-German government in Vienna, not the Czechoslovak government in Prague. Austria, however, was in no military position to defend these lands and since Czechoslovakia declared possession over all the lands of the Bohemian crown, regardless of the German population, they started occupying these lands by force with Czechoslovakia being in control of all the land later to be called the Sudetenland by the start of 1919. Remember Cieszyn and Silesia and how two different governing Polish and Czech bodies were established and then came together in a tenuous demarcation agreement? Well, part of the agreement was that no sovereign rule was to be conducted in the area until a concrete border was agreed upon in Paris. At least, that was the Czechoslovak interpretation of the agreement anyways. But this agreement was then broken by the Poles who started preparing for parliamentary elections in the area which which was seen by Czechoslovakia as a motion of sovereign rule over Cieszyn. Therefore, Czechoslovakia protested to this. The Poles disagreed on the interpretation of the agreement, saying this didn't apply, and so the stage was set for a war in late January 1919. Why was Cieszyn so important to both sides? Well, because not only was it a very important train hub in Central Europe, which was a big deal in 1919, but it also had very large coal mines and steel industry that both of the infant countries needed to strengthen their economic position. On top of that, Czechoslovakia had a further reason why not to give up Cieszyn, and that was because it was part of the Bohemian crown lands with a Polish majority. This meant that if part of the Bohemian crown lands with a Polish majority was to be given to Poland, who's to say that the Bohemian crown lands with a German majority can't be given to Austria? It would set a dangerous precedent that Czechoslovakia was actively trying to avoid. This is why on January 23rd, when Czechoslovakia knew it had the upper military hand since Poland was fighting German and West Ukrainian border disputes, invaded the Polish side of Cieszyn. After seven days of mostly very one-sided fighting and strong diplomatic pressure from the Allies, a ceasefire was reached, with Czechoslovakia now in control of almost all of Cieszyn's economic production. What followed next was more than a year of negotiations during which Czechoslovakia dragged their feet at every possible moment. This was begrudgingly tolerated by the Allies, mostly due to their more negative view of Poland after certain events in Lviv that we will get to soon. However, eventually an agreement was reached in July 1920 where Czechoslovakia was allowed to retain control of the economically slash strategically important areas of Cieszyn and Poland was given Polish majority lands in Spish and Orava. This was later accompanied by another agreement in 1924 that exchanged yet again a few towns between the two countries. Skipping from that to probably the most chaotic area of the former empire, the now self-proclaimed West Ukrainian People's Republic. When this republic was proclaimed on the 1st of November 1918, it was done so because the majority Ukrainian population of Eastern Galicia feared that they would become subject to the new Polish Republic, and these fears were not unfounded as both the Polish Liquidation Committee and the Polish Republic made their intentions of annexing whole of Austrian Galicia very clear. The WPR early on saw a lot of support from the local population and was able to raise an army of almost 100,000 men, which thanks to raiding of abandoned weapon warehouses left behind by the Austro-Hungarian Hungarian military was very well equipped. The army also included a lot of veterans from the Great War, so by November 1918, WPR had a large, well-equipped and well-trained army to be able to withstand not just Poland, but also conduct its own expeditions into Bukovina and Ruthenia. The WPR also symbolically unified with their sister country in the former Russian Empire and somewhat helped with fighting against the Bolsheviks and White Russians, but this unification was only on paper, as both countries continued acting as independent political entities. Plus, WPR was actually very different to the Ukrainian People's Republic, as unlike them, they had an actively well-working bureaucratic system even during this chaotic time which they inherited from Austria-Hungary, not to mention that WPR is much better trained than a equipped army. But coming back to the conflict at hand, to understand the Polish interest in Eastern Galicia we have to look at the primary language map. As you can see, even though Ukrainian is the majority language in the lands claimed by the WPR, there is a very sizable Polish presence with Lviv and the surrounding area even having a Polish majority. And so when Ukrainian troops took over Lviv in early November, it was met with a strong Polish resistance that along with the help from Poland itself managed to retake Lviv by the end of the month. After that, the Polish troops in the city along with its Polish inhabitants attacked much of the Jewish community of Lviv, blaming them for many of the unfortunate events currently happening in Central Europe. How many people died during this attack depends on who you asked, but most historians give the number of around 100 people. 
What was however more devastating in the long run was the looting that accompanied the killings. Around 11.4 million crowns or about 15 to 20 million dollars in today's money worth of wealth was destroyed or looted from Jewish businesses. This pogrom was widely reported in the Western papers including the New York Times and was a very large instigator in Western distrust of the Polish campaigns. Remember the Cieszyn negotiations? Anyways, therefore the Allies became more favorable towards the WPR the following months in early 1919. For the next few months, West Ukrainian troops laid siege to Lviv, but were never fully able to take it. However, they did see some success on the Polish front as a whole, and due to this and also heavy Allied diplomatic involvement, a ceasefire was reached between Poland and the WPR on the 25th of February 1919. After that, a series of very complicated negotiations took place, the result of which is best described by an Allied ambassador presenting an armistice treaty to the WPR on the 30th of February. Today, your military situation is good, but it may soon change to your disadvantage. Poland and Czechoslovakia have signed an armistice, enabling the Poles to transport ammunition over Czech territory. An armistice agreement will also be reached soon between Poland and Germany. The Bolsheviks have not as yet entered Polish territory, and the Poles therefore are not constrained to send an army against them. Realizing this, the Poles are strengthened and encouraged. If our proposal is not accepted by you, the whole Entente will hold you responsible. On one side, you will be at war with Poland, which will have the support of Generals Haller's well-organized 6 divisions, while on the other side, the Bolsheviks, having already taken Kiev and a majority portion of your territories, are advancing relentlessly upon you. However, you accept our proposal, all efforts will be made to recognize your independence, the very fact that we are negotiating with you by putting forward this proposal is, to a certain extent, proof of our recognition of your state. One does not negotiate with something that does not exist. With our help, you will defeat the Bolsheviks, regain your lost territories and will not come empty-handed to the peace conference. Steps are being taken to include your representatives at the peace conference and a diplomatic mission will be sent to you which will keep our countries informed of your needs. Remember the proverb, heaven helps those who help themselves. For you, the Entente represents this heaven. Your decision could mean the beginning of a new existence and national independence. Never and nowhere will you have an opportunity such as this again. It is a great and solemn moment. The future of your nation, is in your hands. Among other things, the Armistice Treaty defined the divisions between the two countries with Poland taking control of Lviv and the very important oil fields south of the city. However, any oil slash revenue gotten from the oil fields will be equally divided between the WPR and Poland. WPR commanders, after some heavy debating, decided they didn't want to give up the territory they already controlled nor the very important city of Lviv, and so they refused the treaty and cancelled the ceasefire the following March. As pointed out by the Allied ambassador, Poland was now more than capable of defeating the WPR, which they did a couple of months later with the WPR ceasing to exist mid-July 1919. Skipping over from there, we'll now look at southern lands of Austria. First, Carinthia. Here, Austrians and Slovenians, with some support from Serbian volunteers, have been in a conflict since October. This was because the area of Carinthia had a mixed population with a German majority as a whole, but with southern provinces having a Slovenian majority when taken individually. Naturally, during the breakup of the empire, multiple councils were established, either proclaiming loyalty to Vienna or Ljubljana. The two sides eventually came to a demarcation agreement, and in November 1918, the Slovenian General Rudolf Meister started occupying the towns agreed upon as being under Slovenian control. However, disagreements over the interpretation of the demarcation lines came by the end of the month as Meister captured Volkermarkt, a town that Austrians argued wasn't included in the agreement. As such, tensions rose and by the time of January 1919, the simple occupation of their respective demarcation lines turned into an all-out war between the two countries. Slovenian troops emerged having the upper hand and even started planning an attack on Klagenfurt in February. 
but by that time a ceasefire was negotiated due to pressure from the Allies. The Allies, after inspecting the situation in the area, decided a plebiscite will be held which included some of the towns that were agreed to be Slovenian possession in the first demarcation agreement. This was unacceptable for the Slovenians as they knew if a plebiscite was held taking the entire region as a whole they weren't going to win. So at the end of April they broke the ceasefire and launched a full scale offensive. This proved not so successful and Austrian troops actually managed to push the Slovenian forces all the way back to Slovenia where they were stopped by the Yugoslav forces that came to reinforce the front. More Yugoslav troops came the following month and with their help another Slovenian offensive was launched which by early June captured much of Klagenfurt Basin. This was however for naught as the Allies now fed up with all the fighting issued an ultimatum to Yugoslavia to withdraw from the area so a plebiscite can be held or else. Yugoslav troops reluctantly withdrew and the plebiscite results showed that 60% of the population wanted to remain with Austria. What is however interesting is that half of the Slovenian population in the area voted to remain with Austria as they saw themselves having stronger ties to Austria than Yugoslavia. Therefore, outside of a few border towns that were agreed to be given to Slovenia, Carinthia as a whole remained in Austrian possession. Then there's the Adriatic question, or the Adriatic problem, which is the struggle between the newly formed Yugoslavia and the Kingdom of Italy over the former Austrian Adriatic coast. The Allies agreed to give all of this land to Italy during the 1915 London Agreement, which brought Italy into the war. However, as Austria-Hungary fell apart and minorities within the country started claiming land, the Adriatic coast was claimed first by the state of Slovene Croats and Serbs and later Yugoslavia. And considering that outside of Western Istria, all of this land had a Yugoslav ethnic majority, the rest of the Allies started to backtrack on their promise to Italy. They did give Italy Austrian majority South Tyrol, but this was different since Austria was the enemy and it was easier to swallow giving a majority Austrian land away than Yugoslav land because Yugoslavia was part of the Allies. Not to mention the post-war campaign of the USA for self-determination. The Paris peace talks were then further complicated by the fact that Yugoslav forces and civilians clashed with the Italian army occupying the Adriatic coast, leading mostly America but also Britain and France to send occupation forces of their own to the area to try to ease the tensions. Many proposals and counter-proposals were made but none of the two countries could agree on anything and the rest of the allies became increasingly irritated with the talks going nowhere considering they had their hands full with other large problems happening all over the former empire. Plus while the talks were going nowhere the clashes between the two countries continued to increase. In the end, 12th of November 1920, Treaty of Rapayo was signed between the two countries ending the dispute over the Adriatic coastline, which now looked like this. In the treaty, the city of Fiume would become independent, but it was later given to Italy under the Treaty of Rome in 1924. The Italians viewed this entire situation as a backstab by the Allies who promised them everything in the London Agreement only to not help them during the actual peace talks, resulting in Italy having to sign a treaty which didn't give them as much land as they wanted. Lastly, we'll look at Burgenland. This area was part of the Hungarian Kingdom, but it had a German-speaking majority. Therefore, in the Treaty of Saint Germain, it was decided to be given to Austria. However, this had to be postponed as Hungary was having a thing, which we'll touch upon in my next video. Once Horthy came into power and Hungary was again cooperating with the Allies, the transition of Burgenland was set for August 1921. But Hungarians and Croatians in the area around Sopron created a militia to fight the Austrians because they didn't want to be part of Austria. After repulsing the Austrians, they declared their own republic, the Leitbanzak. The Hungarian government couldn't do anything about this as under the Allied treaties they had to withdraw their troops from the area and the Austrians were unable to defeat the scrappy militia who employed very successful guerrilla tactics against them. So Austrians started negotiations with the Hungarians to figure out what to do next, all while Leitbanzak acted as its own country. Trains going through it had to pay dues, they printed their own stamps and even had their own elections. From these elections, elections, the people decided they wanted to be a monarchy. However, a split between who should be the monarch happened and the state started to fall apart on its own. Meanwhile, Austria and Hungary reached an agreement on what to do. Hungary will help Austria occupy the new country, which now was much easier as Leitbanzak was falling apart, all while a plebiscite will be held in the Sopron area as this was the main area which had a sizable Croatian and Hungarian population that didn't want to join Austria. In December 1921, Sopran voted to stay with Hungary while the rest of Bergenland joined Austria. 
This is where I will conclude the video about the Treaty of Saint Germain and the lands it dealt with. Obviously I couldn't talk about everything, like for example the post-war state of Austria itself, because this video can't go on forever. However, I will give a more general overview ending of the breakup of the entire empire in my Treaty of Trianon video coming out the 31st of July, so if you don't want to miss that, subscribe and hit the bell icon. This video is made possible thanks to my amazing patrons. As always, my name is Emlazer and stick around for history.